World Architecture News. Today, we explore the importance of putting the eye in BIM. Hello. Building design is always moving through technology barriers, and there can be no doubt the threshold on most architects' minds today is BIM. Today, we're pleased to welcome Aurelia Rodriguez of Kieran Timberlake and Erin Ray Hoffer of Autodesk in the first of a series of case studies looking under the bonnet of Revit. Kieran Timberlake used Autodesk Revit for their highly acclaimed Loblolly House. So, um, had you used Revit before this project, Marilla? Uh, no, Loblolly House was our first use of, of Revit in the office. That was in, in 2005, um, and the project was completed at the end of 2006. Yeah, what prompted you to use Revit in, 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 this, in this project? So the house was a was a proof of concept for some of the provocations that were made in our book, uh, Refabricating Architecture, and it was it, it proposed a different method of building using offsite fabricated assemblies that uh, were attached on site to an industrial aluminum frame. Okay. So the goal was to assemble it in in only six weeks. So based on those objectives. Uh, we knew that we needed a, a different process of, of, um, for, for how information would be exchanged between us and our engineers, the sure. fabricators, um, the suppliers, and we knew that typical 2D documentation wouldn't be able to provide what was required to, to achieve some of these objectives. Okay. I mean, you, the, the uh, construction time is six weeks. That sounds impressive to me. I mean, what, what would you think that a building of this size and volume would take using more traditional methods? Well, I, I think it depends on the construction yeah. type. Um, and, and really, it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to, okay. um, to answer because of the fact that the, the whole product, the whole um, assembly was very specific to off-site fabrication. Right. You know, the pieces like the aluminum frame and, and the, the wall and floor panel components were all designed specifically for this type of construction. Sure. You know, if we were talking about kind of a thick frame uh, building, it, it, it would definitely be, I mean, I could say a, a year. Okay. <laughs> You're kidding. That's incredible. Okay. So um, why was the project particularly complex? Uh, the project programmatically in in my opinion is not complex it's a it's a two story 1800 square foot residence the complexity the complexity really lied in the in the way that the components were assembled we were we were merging highly precise materials like the aluminum frame where the tolerances were you know plus minus 1 to 2 millimeters <laughs> Uh, with much less precise materials, like the wood used for the floor and the wall panels. So it, it was really understanding that complexity that, that I think became difficult. Sure, sure. And, and can I ask, who, who was the driver to use Revit in, on this project? Um, our, I think our office was the driver. Karen okay. Timberlake was the driver. And, okay. and we were the, the authors of the building information model. Right. Okay. Maybe we could ask Erin um, uh, a question. I, I, I see that so you started work on the project in 2005. I mean, Erin, how, how has um, Revit kind of evolved since then as a, a few years gone by? Uh, presumably it, it's changed quite a bit since then. Right. It, uh, that's a great question. And one of the things that um, uh, has changed dramatically is the adoption in the industry. Uh, I was reading a recent survey that's been put out by McGraw-Hill Construction uh, smart market report. There's a 2010 report, particularly on the topic of prefabrication, which is really fascinating because they uh, cite some dramatic statistics uh, about use. They said in 2013, based on the survey respondents, 98%, this is architects, engineers, and contractors, anticipate using prefabrication on projects. Um, that's not the same as the people who are using BIM, but yeah. there's a close correlation because BIM over the past number of years since 2005 and even before when it first 
uh, you know, years before that when it was uh, being introduced into the market to now, we've seen a dramatic increase in the adoption of BIM in in, uh, in many of the regions around the world and particularly in the U.S. Okay. So uh, I think um, the latest report on this topic said 73% uh, have reported use of BIM on some projects, and 52% say over half of their projects are using BIM. So I think that's, um, you know, Revit particularly has evolved in a number of features that respond to the fact that people on a broader basis are using this method for design and construction. And the collaboration that was just mentioned is a really important part of the value that um, the project team as a whole will get from use, even on much larger projects than this one that we're talking about now. Okay. Um, thanks, Erin. Um, so, so Marilia, can, can you just um, tell us a little bit about how you actually uh, utilized Revit on the, the Loblolly House? Uh, sure. You know, Revit was, was pretty central to our process. We used it for for the design, for the coordination, for uh, procurement of, of materials, and for fabrication. So all the components with their pre-installed mechanical and electrical systems were all developed and refined within this model. Uh, the coordination of these systems was really critical, not only to better understand the, the, the actual fabrication of components, but also to to develop a strategy for how they would come together when we arrived on site. Right. So rather than um, you know, producing and exchanging coordination drawings, for example, we use the model to communicate with, with the fabricators and with engineers. Uh, we try to detect all possible conflicts and resolve them virtually before we showed up on site. Um, this allowed us to, to really eliminate delays and, and wasted resources and, and, and also control the cost. I, I mean, mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing that I was particularly interested in is you, you mentioned that you, um, you ordered the materials from the parts list, sort of from the model. I mean, what, were, were those parts lists that, that, that were, did you create those yourselves or did you actually import some um, um, sort of production items from manufacturers in, into the model? Well, at the time, uh, there there weren't a lot of manufacturers sure. that had Revit information available, so we actually built those parts okay. uh, in our office. And things like the the Bosch aluminum frame, for example, uh, were ordered from a parts list uh, extracted from the model, and those parts were were modeled by by us. Sure. It sounds like you, you, you were pretty brave pioneering this. Erin, um, I mean, presumably for people that are new to BIM, uh, you've got um, a, a training package that they can uh, join up to. Well, there's quite a lot of opportunities for education. Um, there are many uh, companies that are uh, associated with the product that work with uh, local firms that provide firsthand education. Uh, many uh, institutions of higher education have integrated Revit and uh, tools of this type into their curriculum, so students coming out of those programs often have a lot of great background. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to um, refer to a point that was just made. I think, you know, Marilla made a great point about the information and also about manufacturers, because you had asked what's changed since 2005-2006. Um, and one of the huge changes is the adoption by manufacturers uh, who understood how important it was for their products to be uh, viewed by people using Revit as a design tool, direct access to be able to specify or to design around things that manufacturers want designers to know about. And um, I was really struck by this recently at the AIA convention when I would go to the booths of uh, companies providing doors and all sorts of uh, products, windows, uh, you know, architectural elements, and, and many of those manufacturers now have Revit models that uh, designers can use to more effectively uh, integrate those products. So that's one of the big changes we've seen. And it's really, it's not just about geometry, it's about that I in BIM, it's about sustainability, which is a huge uh, trend that many of us are paying a lot of attention to because as a designer you really want to know what are the characteristics of that element you're going to specify in your design and BIM is an avenue for being able to analyze your design from that standpoint also. I mean that's that's a really interesting point you're mentioning about the the manufacturers picking up on this now and seeing the advantage I mean presumably the um the, the um 
there's a great advantage for the architect in, in not having to detail these uh, you know, th these components that, that, that the manufacturers have already done that. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely a time saver. And I think what it really, what it really helps us to do is, um, again, it's, it's the, that element of information in the model. So it's not only a 3D model, but it could have cost information embedded in it. It could have, you know, weight and, and, and many other parameters that would, would help us to, to design you know, in a more, in a smarter way. And, and can I ask if there were any unexpected outcomes from the BIM process? Um, I think the results were you know, overwhelmingly positive. And we really, um, it was really, really clear uh, why we chose to use BIM once we arrived on the job site and the components began to come together just as we, just as we had planned. That's fantastic. It was um, certainly a contrast to, to typical construction. You know, in order to meet the six-week uh, target, all the components were ordered and manufactured uh, before we arrived on site. So that, that eliminated the possibility of, of field verification, which uh, in, in our world we rely on quite, quite a bit. And instead, we really just use the model. Um, and just as an example, the, the interior stair fabricator um, wanted to come to the site to measure the opening for the stair before he began his fabrication. And I had to explain to him that there was no house to field measure <laughs> and that we were able to approve uh, the dimensions using the model. And it definitely took, took some convincing, to say the least. And <laughs> When, when the stair arrived, uh, arrived on site, we were, we were told that it was the most accurate stair opening that they've, that they've installed in. Oh, it really fit, you know, fit perfectly. Okay. I, actually, a question for, for Erin. I mean, listening to um, this part about um, uh, pulling the materials off and ordering them um, in advance of the site so everything is pre-manufactured, is, is there any way that this um, information of real-time delivery expectations. I mean, is, is um, Revit able to, to coordinate the, the deliveries? You know, obviously, if, if things are delayed at the factory, I mean, about you know, programming of works on site. I mean, is there a gap between BIM and the site, or what, what happens in that, that phase of the project? Well, that's a great point because uh, we think about the different definitions of things, and I go back to the Autodesk version of BIM, which is this process that is um, expansive in the way um, Rilla was describing, and it includes, uh, you know, thinking about the project in advance to uh, designing it to constructing it, and then owning and operating that building, whatever it happens to be. So when we talk about BIM, we're not just talking about one software product. Uh, Revit is a core piece of that uh, process because Revit is where the authoring is done, where these elements can be specified, and whether so much of the design is determined in that environment. But um, beyond Revit, there are a lot of other products that Autodesk puts into the big umbrella of BIM, uh, some of those manage project uh, deliveries, think about timelines, think, do analysis also in terms of cost, quantities, or, um, you know, other factors such as sustainability. So, so that question about, you know, products and where they are and how they can be delivered is part of this big ecosystem of BIM that okay. does go beyond Revit to a large extent, but relies on the data that is developed in the model. Um, we, just another example of the office building that I'm in was uh, developed in a similar process to the one described on this project. And one of the things that we did was tag a lot of the uh, furnishings, which are uh, office-based furnishings, with RFID tags. And we used software from one of our partners that allowed the contracting team to know at any moment whether a piece of furniture was on a truck, was in a warehouse, off-gassing so it could be installed, yeah. or was already installed. And they could look at the Revit uh, model and kind of look at the aggregation of all the models that were provided, you know, in a different tool that contractors like to use, which is called Navis, Navisworks. So there's a whole set of processes that you just described to make sure the project uh, is going on track, that parts are being delivered, and where they are, and that's all something that BIM uh, really helps people to manage, but it's not only in Revit, it's just a bigger picture. Sure. Okay. Um, Marilia, what, what would you say you've learned from this process? 
I think we learned a lot from this process, <laughs> and and it really it really highlighted the the potential of, of building information modeling for, for visualization and, and coordination um, and for this project specifically for fabrication and, and assembly. We use, we use BIM now on all our projects at all scales uh, from you know, new construction to renovations and additions. And we, we build a BIM model of a, of a Saarinen building from you know, the 1960s for a renovation and addition. We've used it for a new lab building at Rice University that, um, that took 33 months. So it, it's really, it, it's, I think its capabilities have, have certainly been highlighted. Sure. And Erin, what, what do you see as the, um, the, next, the next stages in, in the evolution of BIM? Well, I, it's an exciting time because as BIM becomes more widely adopted and we see it now becoming more of a standard in the industry, it opens up opportunities to address uh, issues where the industry as a whole is not performing. And I think that BIM is an avenue for people to do uh, better work because, you know, as a designer, you, know, you aspire to have the highest quality in your project. And if you're using a tool like BIM, there are uh, opportunities to visualize, to explain things to clients in new ways. So, um, you know, and then there's the efficiency of construction. Uh, if, you know, if we can have a more efficient process through collaboration, then that owner will, will benefit because that project can either increase the quality with a given budget or you know the owner can save money on that project and, and the project can perform financially to a higher degree which in this day and age is a huge issue for most people um, who are developing the built environment so I think that the next generation of BIM is really how it changes our way of thinking and working um, so that we can be you know better contributors to society that may seem a bit um, optimistic and aspirational but I, I guess I'm personally convinced that sustainability is such a high priority uh, as well as you know better quality projects so that our cities can perform better so I just see BIM as an avenue for that because it makes all of the participants in the design process the construction process and owning and management process you know more well informed about making decisions Thanks, Erin. Well, that's fantastic. Well, exciting times, and um, thanks for participating in this. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It was a fascinating Thank interview. Look forward to hearing it. All right. Thanks very much. World Architecture News.